There are two sides to every story. The National Broadcasting Company presents the vivid drama of life itself. Broadcasting's original program of mediation, The Court of Human Relations. And now the man who has familiarized millions of people with the idea of mediation helped to make it a creative force in American life. A.L. Alexander. You know, I've always been rather fond of words. In fact, I suppose there are some people who would say that I'm entirely too fond of them. But sometimes in spare moments, I like to speculate as to the most beautiful words in the English language. I don't mean uh, combinations of words, but words themselves. Words like love and truth and beauty, goodness, hope. And I think of two little words, how very beautiful, just like music, they must sound in a courtroom to some people when a jury speaks them, not guilty. Words that bring release from despair. Well, words can be very beautiful, but they can also create a lot of trouble. And we have an issue here involving that very subject. Now, this is case number 4788. And I'm going to introduce uh, the members of the board to you. This is one of our most distinguished sociologists, judge, and in the center is a, a noted clergyman, Dr. Lloyd E. Foster. And to your left is one of the most famous lawyers in America. And I hope you'll never go so far as to need a lawyer, but uh, if you do, we can recommend him as one of the most uh, capable and also one of the most expensive lawyers in the country, mm -hmm. the Honorable Frederick R. Coudere. <laughs> now, um, I wonder if we can't submit this issue to this board and arrive at some kind of reasonable settlement. Here is the complainant. Well, I'd like to know if I have to put up with something that's making a nervous wreck out of me. I don't know which way to turn. I'm at the end of my rope. My husband has a habit of... Uh, he, he just insults everybody who comes to the home. That is, if they don't happen to agree with them. For instance, the other night, I had a group of friends visiting. And he started in the usual way, with the usual wind-up. And uh, this is very embarrassing. Well, why, um, why does this trouble exist? Why does uh, he insult people? Well, because they don't happen to agree with them. Well, tell us what happened uh, this other evening. Well, I had a group of friends there, and... Uh, well, they now, you're a little upset. Suppose mm -hmm. you tell us about your own condition. Why, does this, uh, why is this so disturbing to you? Well, I have a bronchial and respiratory condition, and uh, that's triggered by nervous tension. And my doctors have told me that I have to leave New York City and go to live in a dry, high, dry climate. I've told my husband I just can't take this anymore. He doesn't understand. I have to have this settled somehow. Well, what seems to be the reason for this unpleasantness? We address the husband, the respondent. What seems to be the reason? Well, I just can't stand people who believe everything they see, everything they hear. It just, I just can't stand it. I'm 74 years old. My doctor tells me I have a heart condition. And I haven't any too long to live. And well, I now, believe... Now, what's that got to do with this particular situation? I know that the mediators are very sympathetic toward both your ailments. You have a respiratory condition and you have a heart condition, which might indicate that you ought to be, have regard for each other's feelings and welfare. But now, um, what is it that you feel that you have the right to do? I believe I have a right to express my own feelings in my own home and the people that come to my home don't agree with me, I'm willing to debate with them. I'm always open for debate. If they, I'm wrong, I'll admit it. You want them to debate you? Yes. 
Well, now, what was the particular incident that uh, caused this unpleasantness that brought the matter to a head? <laughs> I made a claim that George Burns didn't know how to smoke a cigar, especially he didn't show it on television. Trivial. Didn't, didn't do what? He didn't show on television that he, that he understood how to smoke a cigar. And uh, that's what caused the argument? Yes, that was the argument. Well, what would you consider as the proper way to smoke a cigar? Well, I enjoy a cigar. I'd bite off the end, chew it a little bit, get the flavor, then turn it around slowly while you get an even flame all around, then sit back with a smile and watch the smoke curl up to the ceiling. I get enjoyment out of a cigar. It's one of my main enjoyments. And this fellow that you had the argument with, he had disagreed with me. He said if George Burns didn't know how to smoke a cigar, he wouldn't smoke one on television. They believe everything they see. And what did your wife try to do? She naturally tried to shush me up. And would you and be shushed? And I shush refused to be shushed up. Well, I don't invite people to my home to debate. I invite them to have a sociable evening and get along in a pleasant way. Uh, for instance, uh, the man that was talking to him, that was arguing with him, or he was arguing with about that silly cigar, um, he was so exasperated at my husband's stubbornness that he got up and went in the other room. This makes me feel very uncomfortable. Well, apparently your husband feels that he has the right to uh, enjoy discussions. But I don't enjoy unpleasantness. I enjoy people to visit and just have a sociable time. I can see, I can see how people feel. Uh, I can see how they react. I know how they feel. And uh, it makes me very nervous. And what have you told your husband? Well, I told my husband that if he doesn't break this nasty habit um, of being so argumentative and haranguing, that in view of my health and the climate of the city here, I think we'd be both a lot better off if I were at a distance. Well, we understand, sir, that you're 74 years old and that you feel that you have a right to express your views, whether they're about cigars or anything else. But I think the board might be interested in finding out what else you argue about besides cigars. Taxation. I think a tax, a, a tax problem and the setup, to me, is uh, punk, to use that word. I think it's terrible. What else do you argue about? Well political corruption. I think if we could overcome some of the political corruption, we could overcome some of our high taxes. And uh, I'm willing to debate the subject, but they all tell me I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Well, do you know anything about these things? I don't know anything about these, and I care less. All I know is that it's making me a nervous wreck. Uh, I'm losing my friends. Uh, who wants to come to our house anyhow? You might as well put on a record. Everybody knows what he's going to say. I told my husband, I told him if he didn't stop this, we'd have to do something drastic. I just can't take it anymore. What did your doctor tell you? Well, he told me to uh, give up listening to anything controversial don't uh, read anything controversial, but how are you to know it's controversial until after you've read it? This is the only pleasure I get in life. Well, you know it's controversial if you get into an argument with another man. Yes, but I don't know when I'm, when I'm reading anything whether it's going to be controversial. And it's the only thing I like to read. Well, if, would you be very unhappy if you had to give up controversial matters? Very. What would you very. do if you had to give up controversial matters? Well, I may as well go to bed and forget to wake up, as far as I'm concerned. I think the world is good, but the people in it aren't. I think they're ungodly. Do you have any particular beliefs about the Bible, or about anything that anybody said? Well, 2,000 years ago, Jesus looked out for an honest man, and he failed to find one. And when I look into the slums, and I talk from experience, I visited them, and I see the ill-fed, 
ill-clad and ill-housed, I wonder if we've improved in these 2,000 years. I don't think we have. Well, do other people agree no, with they, you? They, they, they disagree with me. They, they live, to me, they're living in a Kropotkin village. They're living in a glass house. And like electricity, they just, they just take the cause of least resistance. And that's what makes you angry and you argue about it. It burns me up. It agitates me. And you haven't any friends left. We haven't a friend left, very few. Well, how do you feel about this, Dr. Foster? Well, I think there's something very commendable in this husband having definite ideas and convictions but they can become the source of irritation and division, as evidently they have. And what he may not see, that is, psychologically, his vehement defense of his views indicates an insecurity, a lack of confidence. And when he uses force uh, rather than persuasion, it reveals that he's not sure of his position as he claims to be. Now, when you are host and hostess, your responsibility is not to generate antagonism and hostility among your guests. It's to generate friendliness and understanding and goodwill. And moreover, this matter of constant argument in the home and in the social gatherings in the home endangers your health. It endangers your peace of mind. It's a very serious factor. And I should like to suggest that you agree that you do not argue in the home, that as you have guests in, there will not be arguments. But you, sir, the husband, when you go down to the store to get a paper or when you buy something at a store, or you're among friends or club or whatever it may be, you do your arguing there. But uh, do not do it in the home. Do you agree with that, Judge Cross? I would go a step further. I would advise the husband not to argue. He tells me he has a heart condition. And the first thing I would say, with the vast amount of literature and good music that there is, that at 74 years of age, you have a right to say, well, I've lived these years, and if the world is what it is, I certainly, in the few remaining years, can't hope to change it by arguing and just cutting my life short. Beside which, the woman you married, you must have some regard for her, and if it upsets her, I can't see why you should even injure your own health and then annoy her. Mr. But Gilbert. I would like to say a word to her, if I may, since I'm the woman on the panel. I think if he were my husband, I would use a sense of humor. I would think of some jokes to tell him, tell him how ridiculous it looks for one man alone to stand against everybody, and even say something to my friends and say, well, you know, my husband has that strange idea that he wants to make everybody better and agree with him. Oh, just take it with a grain of salt and let's laugh him out of it. In other words, just manage the situation. I, if I were, if I were she, that's what I would do. Because as I looked at them, it seems to me that is the almost a childish thing to have discussions about. None of us can change the world. Conditions are such that many of us may di differ and disagree, but to create an issue about it, it seems to me, is childish. And a woman, in that case, has to remember a man never grows up. And I, if I were she, I would take. A matter in my own hands and try to see that he sees the humorous side of trying to make everybody agree with him. Well, does counsel concur with that admonition I from the bench? I think Judge Cross put a finger right on it, and I think that's the way to handle it. There's nothing more satisfactory than pleasant conversations, certainly. And pleasant conversations should be encouraged and should be enjoyed. And if it gets beyond that and becomes too vehement, then the party of the second part doesn't enjoy it and it ceases to be a pleasant conversation. Well, there appears to be no question about the fact that it's gratifying to win an argument, but the question is at what price? And the board agrees unanimously with the wife here that whatever satisfaction in these wars of words, these polemic arguments is derived by the husband, it is completely nullified by the results. Mr. Mr. Alexander, I think if when he gets so excited about it, you just come over, put her arm around him and say, honey, now, you know, you're just hurting yourself and you're getting no one, no, uh, getting nowhere. Nobody's paying any attention to what you say. Now, just take care of your health for your sake and for mine. And I'm sure he would start in realizing how foolish it is to go on. 
Mr. Alexander, I, I disagree a bit with Judge Cross. I think she's putting too much responsibility on this wife. She's a very attractive woman. She's intelligent, sympathetic. But uh, we're asking her to do the whole thing. And I think the husband has a responsibility. I think he must agree that he's causing embarrassment to his wife. He's endangering his health. He's antagonizing his guests. And that he has a responsibility. He can do something to make this situation better. And together, the wife using her astuteness and he using his good common sense, they can arrive at a better relationship. Well, we suppose it is difficult, Dr. Foster, for a man with convictions to accept the fact that the company, which is not of his own choosing, uh, is always uh, uh, right. But um, it would seem that um, this board states that that's the way it will have to be that he'll have to uh, adjust his attitude, and if the husband wants to keep the home fires burning, he'll have to take that into consideration. Looks to me as if they care very much for one another. Not, it ought not to be too difficult to adjust the situation. Would I say a word? Uh, just as soon as we conclude this. <laughs>